I am wired. Can you see me wired? Yes. Actually, we are all wired in our brains. We are wired according to the assumptions that we take as facts. Assumptions on which we live in this life. We assume certain things. Never check whether any proof is needed or not. Assumptions are reality for us. That's the wiring in our brain. The truth is, you can rewire your brain. You can rewire by looking at all the assumptions once again. Say, why am I assuming this? Is something else possible? Just by looking at what your assumptions are, you can change. And when you change by just the awareness of your assumption, your brain gets rewired. Your life changes. You can become a different person if you like. I was told by somebody that you can cure all your illnesses by rewiring your brain. A video was sent to me of an Indian girl here who has practiced meditation with visualization and able to cure all the body's ailments through that process. Because even medical science today admits the great power of the mind over matter. A lot of stuff that goes on in our bodies is because of what is happening in our head. When there is so much stress in our head, the body suffers and we get sick. We try to treat the body and not the cause, causes in the head. So therefore, very often, if you find that you are having problems with the body, Look at what is happening in your head. Are there any stresses in your life? Is something putting pressure on you in your head? Or something causing you too much tension and mental problem? Try to solve those problems and you will be able to heal your body. Something people have tried successfully. So that is why I say that you can rewire your brain by Looking at your assumption, try that experiment. In the morning, I was telling you about different levels of masters and how one can go within oneself to different levels and discover what those masters teach us. Another question people ask me again and again is, do we have to go to a particular ashram, dera, institute to do meditation? I must tell you, God does not live in the houses we built. He lives in the design He has created, the human body. When we run to a place, to a temple, to look for God, we are carrying the God with us in our own temple with us. Man-made temples don't carry. They are logistical reasons to get together. Just for logistical purposes, these are created. The real temple of God is the head the body, within ourselves. We have to go within this ourselves. No need to go anywhere. People in the old days thought you have to renounce the world. Otherwise, you are always attracted to the world. And they renounced the world, went into forests, mountain tops, Himalayas, to go and do meditation. If you go and meet those people, I happened to work in those mountains, Himalaya mountains, for many years. And I met many of those people, sadhus, yogis, sitting there meditating. And when they talked to me, they talked of what they had left behind. That means their mind was still on what they left behind. It was better to deal with what they left behind, where they were left behind, rather than go away and then worry about it from a distance. You cannot run away from anything. If something is bothering you here, by going somewhere else, it will not stop bothering you. To try to figure out that you can detach yourself by running away doesn't work. I've often said, detachment cannot be practiced. I came to the United States and I found a very nice food item which I could eat called pizza. 
not only pizza made by a special company called Shakey's Pizza. I like the saying on the wall, G old Shakey Pizza and that Shakey Pizza don't make money and banks don't make pizza. Don't use any credit card here. Things like that. So I still remember. I said I am getting attached to pizza. I thought I was a very detached person, living a very simple life in India. And now the first thing I am doing is to get attached to something. I said, I am going to try to detach myself. And I closed my eyes and no more shake his pizza. Every time I said shake his pizza, sign came in front of me. The more I tried to detach, the more attached I was. I discovered detachment never works. You can try as hard as you like. The harder you try, the more attached you get. Then there must be some method by which we can actually achieve detachment. Now you know the detachment comes by attachment to something else. Pizza Hut came, I forgot she had this. <laughs> Not really, because I wouldn't tell you the story now, I really forgot. It is an attachment to something else. Great master used to give example of little children, little girls playing with their dolls. They took the doll so seriously, got so attached to them, that they would fight over it. Nobody can take my doll. How dare you? Even parents could not take the dolls away. Even they had to have the dolls with them to go to sleep at night. So attached to those dolls. And when those girls got married, and they were going to their husband's house, they said, we'll take our dolls with us. And they packed the dolls in the suitcases they carried. After many years, they had no children. Dolls were still in those suitcases. The new attachment, called the detachment, is always another attachment that makes you detached. One of the main reasons why perfect living masters are here giving us an experience of pure love. Because that makes us attached to them and we get detached from everything else. One of the main functions by which they appear here for us. We don't realize that. We are all constantly thinking, what are they teaching us? They are not teaching us anything. They are detaching us from worldly attachments to pure love, to attachment to a love, which we don't recognize in the beginning. As we go along, we see the power of that love. That attachment, new attachment within ourselves. One can question, what is the difference between being attached to a person here and being attached to another person we call a monster? They're both here, both physical. What's the difference between the two? The difference is that unlike other teachers who teach you what is outside, perfect living masters say, don't come to us, go within yourself. But we tell them, but we love you. We want to be with you. They say, go inside. You see what you find there. When we follow their instruction and go inside, same master are inside. First time we realize the master, real master, is not the physical form we saw outside, but the master inside us. It's amazing. But we can't see inside. They are not connected with inside. Therefore, they appear outside. And they direct us to go within ourselves to find the real master who really guide us within ourselves. Those masters, with that awareness of totality, when they come here, they become our friends so we can experience the true love with them. Then when they tell us to go within, we see them also inside. And then we open our eyes outside, inside. Throughout our spiritual journey, at all the levels I mentioned in the morning, the master we have seen outside is with you inside. Then we realize the master is not what we thought it is. Because the awareness of the human being outside was at all levels while he was a human being. Therefore, he is with us at all levels in our own journey inside. It's a very beautiful arrangement made up. The master inside is just appearing outside. Master inside is appearing in the astral plane. Master inside appearing at causal plane. Master inside appearing at the spiritual plane. And we begin to feel we are never alone. 
I can guarantee if you do meditation and manifest the master inside, you will never be alone. Loneliness will become a thing of the past. When I meet people and they talk of loneliness, I tell them, have a friend who is inside you. Any time you will feel inside. Once you start feeling that friend inside, afterward you will also be able to see the friend outside. It's a very beautiful experience. That's part of the deal we get from a perfect living master. The master is with us at all times. And it's a friendship like no other friendship. Other friendships are somewhat conditional. I am doing this for you. What have you done for me lately? Things like that. But the perfect living master love is completely unconditional. You'd be surprised how non-judgmental these perfect living masters are. They never judge. They never see how good or bad we are. They only see one thing. What are we seeking? What is our seeking inside? If you are seeking the truth, they are our friends. They are with us all the time. It's the seeker that brings them to our life, that they appear in our life. So that is why it's very important to know that the masters are not outside. They appear outside for our sake and they remain with us at every level. What happens at the end of the journey? We find our true self was the master, not somebody else. The only one true self <coughs> held in consciousness was the master, same became us, same became the master at this level. Imagine the beauty of this experience. Imagine the realization. That is the best thing that can happen as it is possible for a human being to reach that state. So wonderful. Some people say, you are telling us to go within. Who will do the work outside? You are telling to do meditation. I have to run my business. I have to take care of my family, I have to take care of my children. Are you suggesting that we renounce all our duties, responsibilities, the obligation that we have and just start a selfish, a selfish journey into your own self? Good question. <coughs> no, I have never suggested that you give up responsibilities and obligations. You have to go through them. You have to do them. If you don't do it, I assure you, you have to come back again to do it. Therefore, the spiritual path that these masters tell us does not say run away from your responsibilities and obligations in this world. It says perform them as effectively as you can. There is a saying the Lord Krishna said, Yoga Karma Sukhaushalam, which means true yoga, true union with the self arises when you can act here in the most skillful way without expecting a reward for it. Just to clear your account. Act as skillfully as you can. Whatever talents you have, use those talents to fulfill your responsibilities. Therefore, which is our, which is our dera, which is our ashram, which is our institute where we have to go? This world where we are doing, fulfilling our obligations. Right in the middle of this world, Right in the middle of doing all our jobs. Maybe I am emphasizing it too much because only a few hours ago I took over three new jobs. <laughs> I became the chairman and CEO of a company I founded long ago called All Star Foods Incorporated. I became chairman and CEO of another company called Mira by Products that had a trade secret. Which is my secret I don't share with people. <laughs> when I don't share it, it becomes more secret. <laughs> and then there's a skincare skincare company called Hot Green Beauty Incorporated. I took over the leadership of that company. I'll be very busy running three corporations. It will not interfere at all with my spiritual journey. Remember, these things that you do here are being done with your mind with your body, with your skills learned through these. What the spiritual journey is a response to, with love and devotion to something more real than anything. Both go together. You do not have to separate anything. So do your duties as best as you can. 
if you want to understand the very basis of how these duties come about, I can explain it as explained by several teachers earlier. There is a law prevailing called the law of karma, law of cause and effect. That all the obligations we think have fallen upon us have been created by us in previous times, maybe previous lives, maybe earlier in this life. And they have to be paid off. Whatever we have created, we have sown certain seed, fruit will come, good or bad. When we do something with intention which is good, I want to help that person, it becomes a good karma. Supposing you only have an intention, I want to do this good, but you didn't go the, get the opportunity to do good, you still created a good karma. Supposing you actually do the good, the karma gets multiplied. Supposing you have an intention to do something bad, but you don't do it, you change your mind, karma is still created. What happens with this good karma and bad karma which our mind decides and divides? The moral code of what is good and what is bad is not a universal code at all. Look at history, all these codes have changed. Look at the universe, in different countries, different cultures, the codes are different. Moral code is being determined by the way we have grown up in this particular life. And the society we have grown up with, parents we have grown up with, religions we have grown up with, they have imposed these assumptions of moral code in us. But it works like this, that whatever your moral code has been accepted by the mind, when you are having intentions and actions based on that, you are deciding at that time, your mind is telling, your conscience is telling, that part, subtle part of your mind, which determines moral codes, this was good, good thing you did, this was bad, shouldn't have done it. It's all in your own mind. And that very thing creates good and bad karma. So this good and bad karma leads to a result of punishment and reward. The whole system is based on punishment and reward. Good brings reward, punishment brings hurtful pain, suffering. So we are all going through this process because of this law of karma. It's a big law. So we are obliged to fulfill this. That is why if you know that what your karma is requiring you to do is like a debt to be paid because you owed it from previous actions and intentions of yours, isn't it good to pay off cheerfully and say, Good has come, I accept cheerfully. Bad has come, I accept cheerfully and clearing my account. If you look at it like that, you will be able to put up both with good and bad karma very effectively without losing your peace of mind and without losing your temper about things. Otherwise, we are angry with God. Why this karma on me? God did not impose this karma on us. It's just a law here. It's just a local law made by our minds. And we are just playing it out. But let us play it as cheerfully as we can. We can make our life very cheerfully. Consider the debts we have to pay as big. How happy we are happy when we have a loan to repay and we are cleared. Really big relief. That is how we should feel the relief when a karma is paid and pays off. If we look at it like that, a lot of our attitudes will change. So I am very happy to share this thing with you. But I must tell you, I am not saying anything to you from any book. I am saying it from the teachings of great master and the practice of the teaching. That's all. It works. Therefore, I hope that you will take advantage of it and it will work. I am so happy that you came joined me today. And I hope you will meet again next month. We have fixed the dates already for these meetings. These meetings are meant to remind us of some basic truths about ourselves. Because when we are not remembering these, our mind is so clever. It takes us back into a worldly side as if that is the most important thing. Today what we think is most important looks so unimportant after a few days, after a few months. And everything we are doing here looks completely unimportant when we die. What are, we, what are we wasting our time on if we know this? So that is why when we have these meetings, it almost is like putting ourselves back on track on our spiritual journeys. 
I hope that what I share with you is helpful to you in your spiritual journeys to your meditation as a priority number one, not number two. Put it ahead of others. People say we don't have time. We are so busy. Housewives say we are busy taking care of children, kitchen. See, day and night we are working hard. Then we have to go to work outside. Where is the time for meditation? Men say we are so tired of the work. We are like early morning to catch the catch the bus or the train or the or the bus or the driver or car to a job. Where is the time? And I tell them, do you have five minutes? Can you find five minutes? Of course, five minutes is okay. Not two and a half hour. <laughs> okay. Do five minutes. If you do five minutes first thing in the morning, those five minutes will last you the more than two and a half hours. Try it out. If you do five minutes in the morning when you rise, and five minutes before going to sleep at night, I tell you, those will last you for 24 hours. But it should be intensive. Intensive five minutes. Not thinking of what you're going to do next as you are meditating. That's not meditation. Intensive meditation means concentrate your attention within yourself. Say, who am I? Where's my master? Supposing you are initiated by your master, Talk to master. Have a five-minute conversation. Do an intensive meditation that at that time you're thinking of nothing else. Five minutes in the morning, five minutes at night before going to sleep. Very good. Supposing you have more time, I'm not saying only do five minutes. If you have more time, do ten, twenty, one hour, two hours, three hours, five hours, eight hours. <laughs> Depending on the time. Oh, I am not restricting you to any time. I am only saying five, five minutes. Nobody has said to me, I can't even find five minutes. So that, that's why I have chosen a very small number, five minutes. Nobody has said he can't even find five minutes in the morning and five minutes at night. But the main thing is to make it priority number one. See the importance of it. Things we are doing here, not going to go with us when the body is left. They're all connected with the body. And every one of us has to leave the body. Everyone without exception. Masters included. Most healthy athletes included. Everybody included. Nobody lived more than 130 years. This is a very temporary vehicle that we are wearing. Inner vehicles are much longer lasting. They will last longer. What we are doing here, these clothes won't fit us there. Nor will the jewelry be of any use there. Nor will any of the things that we try to acquire. Imagine how much we try to acquire and say, this is mine. Do you know how dangerous that saying is? This is mine. I own it. If you own it and you lose it, the big loss. Everything you own will one day be lost. Everything. Nothing will go with you. The more you are saying, I own this, I own this, the more disappointed you will be. Bigger loss. Why not cut down the loss and say, nothing is mine. I have just come here to use it. It will be given to me just while I'm, my body is here. I am using it. I use it very carefully. Well, then who owns it if you don't own it? Find out any name. Why not say master owns it, God owns it, Lord owns it. It's just a matter of convincing your mind nothing you, you own personally in this body. That is why when we don't try to possess things, make them our own, problems come. Supposing you say these are not mine, but I am just given to you for use. Do you know you use them more carefully? If somebody else's thing given to you to use, you use it more carefully. The truth is, everything has been given to us temporarily to use. They're temporary. Use it well. But don't make it your own. Don't say mine, mine, mine every day. 
and then create a bigger disappointment for you. The biggest problem of that disappointment is you try to come back for the same things and reincarnation becomes inevitable. You can't go anywhere because you want to come back here again and again. You come back here again and again. Don't try to make things. I own them. No. I use them. They have been given to me for use. I hope these little tips will help you in some of the things that you sometimes face. Thank you very much. I'll see you next month.